15 miles above Earth. No checklist, no practice runs, just pure skill and nerves of steel. In 1965, Captain Pete Collins climbed into the cockpit of America's most advanced spy plane and did something that would make even today's test pilots break into a cold sweat. Kelly Johnson, the genius behind the SR-71 Blackbird, looked this Air Force captain straight in the eye and said, take her beyond 90,000 feet. The catch? The simulator wasn't even built yet. What happened next would prove whether American ingenuity could truly conquer the edge of space. Before we dive into Pete Collins' death-defying test flight, you need to understand just how impossible this mission really was. The SR-71 wasn't just another airplane. This was a machine that pushed every boundary of what metal and men could endure. The year was 1965. America was locked in the Cold War, and the Soviets had just proven they could shoot down our high-altitude U-2 spy planes. When pilot Gary Powers got hit over Russia in 1960, it sent shockwaves through Washington. The message was clear. We needed something faster, higher, and untouchable. Kelly Johnson and his team at Lockheed Skunk Works had the answer, but it was so radical that many thought it couldn't be done. The SR-71 Blackbird was designed to cruise at Mach 3 Plus, that's over 2,000 miles per hour, three times the speed of sound. At 80,000 feet, it could survey 100,000 square miles of Earth's surface every single hour. But those were just the official numbers. What Kelly Johnson wanted to know was how much higher this bird could really fly. Enter Captain Pete Collins. Among the elite group of pilots selected for the SR-71 program, Pete stood out. His fellow aviators called him a superstar, and that wasn't just flattery. This man had the kind of flying instincts that can't be taught in any classroom. He had that rare combination of technical brilliance and ice-cold composure that separates good pilots from legends. If you think you know what it takes to be a test pilot, type yes in the comments below and let us know what you think made these men so special. Kelly Johnson didn't make requests lightly. When he asked Pete Collins to push the Blackbird beyond 90,000 feet, he was asking him to fly into unknown territory. Think about that for a moment. Commercial airliners today cruise at 35,000 feet. The SR-71's normal operating altitude was already more than twice that high. Now, Johnson wondered to see if they could almost reach triple that height. But here's what made this truly extraordinary. There was no manual to follow. The simulator that would normally let pilots practice emergency procedures and unusual flight conditions didn't exist yet. The engineers were still building it. Every other test pilot in aviation history had the luxury of practicing their missions dozens of times in a simulator before attempting the real thing. Pete Collins had his experience, his training, and his trust in Kelly Johnson's engineering genius. The morning of the flight, Pete suited up in the pressure suit that would keep him alive at altitudes where the air is so thin that water boils at room temperature. These weren't normal flight suits. They were essentially space suits designed to handle the extreme conditions where the line between aviation and space exploration starts to blur. At 90,000 feet, you're higher than 99% of Earth's atmosphere. The sky turns from blue to almost black. You can see the curvature of the planet below you. Walking out to the Blackbird must have been something special. This wasn't just any aircraft. Every piece of it had been invented from scratch. The titanium skin that covered the airframe had to withstand temperatures over 500 degrees Fahrenheit. When the SR-71 flew at full speed, friction from the air would heat the metal so much that the aircraft actually grew several inches longer. The engineers had to design the fuel tanks to leak on the ground because they only sealed properly when the metal expanded from the heat at high altitude. Pete climbed into that narrow cockpit alongside his reconnaissance systems officer, Conrad Seagroves. Everyone called him Connie. These two men had trained together and built the kind of trust that comes from knowing your life depends on the person sitting behind you. In the SR-71, the pilot and RSO worked as one unit. Connie handled the sophisticated reconnaissance systems and navigation while Pete flew the aircraft. 
the engines roared to life. The J-58 engines were marvels of engineering in themselves. They could operate as both turbojets and ramjets, allowing the SR-71 to accelerate to speeds that would destroy conventional aircraft. Each engine produced over 32,000 pounds of thrust with afterburners engaged. The sound alone was enough to rattle windows miles away. Now here's where it gets interesting. Pete didn't just take off and point the nose up. Flying the SR-71 to extreme altitude required precision that most people can't imagine. The aircraft had what pilots call a narrow flight envelope at high altitude. This means there was a very small margin between flying too slow in stalling and flying too fast in causing structural damage. That margin at 90,000 feet was just a few knots. Thread that needle wrong and the consequences would be catastrophic. As Pete pushed the Blackbird higher and higher, he was writing the book on high-altitude flight. Every piece of data from this mission would help engineers understand what the aircraft could really do. He climbed through 70,000 feet, then 80,000. The official record for the SR-71 wouldn't be set until 1976, when Captain Robert Helt would reach 85,069 feet. But on this day in 1965, Pete Collins was going even higher, and he was doing it without any of the refined procedures that later pilots would have. The view from 90,000 feet is something only a handful of humans have ever seen from an aircraft. Below, the Earth stretches out in a vast panorama. The atmosphere appears as a thin blue line on the horizon. Above, space beckons in dark purple and black. At 90,000 feet, you realize how fragile our planet's protective envelope really is. But Pete wasn't sightseeing. He was monitoring every instrument, feeling every vibration through the controls, listening to every sound the engines made. At these extreme altitudes, the air is so thin that the control surfaces barely bite. Making the aircraft turn or climb requires different techniques than normal flight. Push too hard on the controls, and you could send the plane into an uncontrollable situation. The Blackbird responded beautifully. Kelly Johnson's design proved itself that day. The aircraft that many said couldn't be built was now demonstrating capabilities that seemed impossible. Pete brought her through 90,000 feet and kept climbing. Exactly how high he went remains a detail lost to history and classification. But those who knew Pete said he proved the Blackbird could touch the edge of space. Coming back down presented its own challenges. You can't just push the nose over and descend rapidly from that altitude. The stresses on the airframe, the heating effects, the engine management, everything had to be carefully controlled. Pete had to think several steps ahead, planning his descent profile to keep the aircraft within safe parameters. And then it happened something that would become another chapter in Pete Collins' legend. During that same mission, one of the engines experienced a catastrophic failure. This was the first time an SR-71 had lost an engine in flight. Turbine blades broke apart and shot out the back of the engine like shrapnel. For a heart-stopping moment, Pete and Connie didn't know if those fragments had damaged the rest of the aircraft. Think about that situation. You're 15 miles high, flying three times the speed of sound, and suddenly half your thrust disappears. For most pilots, this would be a career-defining emergency. For Pete Collins, it was another problem to solve. He and Connie worked through the emergency procedures, managing the good engine, adjusting their flight path, and setting up for a landing. The fact that Pete brought that Blackbird home safely with one engine taught Kelly Johnson in the Air Force something invaluable. The SR-71 could survive an engine failure. This wasn't just about one pilot's skill. It was proof that the aircraft design was sound enough to handle catastrophic failures and still keep flying. That knowledge would save lives in the years to come. Kelly Johnson personally presented Pete Collins with a model of the SR-71 after that flight. The photograph of that moment shows Johnson's respect for what Pete had accomplished. Johnson trusted this man with his multi-million dollar creation, and Pete had proven that trust was well-placed. The American military has always attracted people of extraordinary caliber, but even among that elite group, the SR-71 pilots stood in a category of their own. 
These weren't just skilled aviators. They were test pilots, engineers, and pioneers all rolled into one. They took machines that existed at the absolute cutting edge of technology and pushed them even further. The lessons from the SR-71 program continue to influence aerospace design today. Modern stealth aircraft, hypersonic missiles, and space planes all owe something to the innovations pioneered by Johnson's team and validated by pilots like Collins. The technologies developed for the Blackbird found their way into countless other applications. That day, in 1965, when Pete Collins took the SR-71 beyond 90,000 feet, stands as a testament to what's possible when excellence meets opportunity. He didn't have the safety net of simulator training. He didn't have detailed procedures written by dozens of test pilots who had gone before. He had his skill, his courage, and his faith in American engineering. The SR-71 Blackbird remains an icon of American aerospace achievement. Museum visitors today still gather around these magnificent machines, marveling at their sleek lines and trying to imagine what it must have been like to fly them. The statistics are impressive, but they don't capture the human element. They don't convey the sound of those engines at full power, the feeling of three times the force of gravity pushing you back in your seat during acceleration, or the view from the edge of space. Pete Collins and his fellow Blackbird pioneers earned their place in aviation history through missions that tested the limits of human capability and machine performance. They flew into the unknown so that those who came after would have a path to follow. Their legacy is measured not just in records and achievements, but in the inspiration they provide to future generations of aviators. These men represented the finest traditions of American military aviation. They volunteered for dangerous duty, trained to the highest standards, and executed their missions with precision and professionalism. The SR-71 program succeeded because of people like Pete Collins, who refused to accept limitations and pushed themselves to achieve the extraordinary. So the next time you see an SR-71 Blackbird in a museum, remember Captain Pete Collins. Remember that first flight beyond 90,000 feet with no simulator training. Remember Connie Seagrokes working the systems in the back seat. Remember Kelly Johnson trusting his design and his pilot to accomplish something that had never been done before. And remember that American innovation, American courage, and American excellence made it all possible. If you enjoyed learning about this incredible piece of aviation history, hit that like button and subscribe for more stories about the brave men and women who pushed the boundaries of flight. Their stories deserve to be remembered and shared.